everybody. I think we are live now on Facebook. Hopefully we have lots of people following us. Um, oh, sounds coming into the room. <laughs> Let's admit him. Um, so this is our DSM Forum brunch. You must be quite used to us by now on a Saturday morning. We have a conversation with celebrity guests in diabetes. And today we have <laughs> our <laughs> celebrity <Your> psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> but first we'll just introduce the team so my name is Amanda I'm a diabetes specialist nurse in Medway Beth I'm Beth I'm a diabetes specialist nurse down in Southampton Camden I'm Camden I'm a diabetes specialist nurse at the Royal State University Hospital and Vicky um, I'm Vicky and I'm a community diabetes specialist nurse working for Liverpool Diabetes Partnership and our special guest today is Dr. Rose Stewart. Would you like to introduce yourself, Rose? Hello, I'm Rose and I'm a clinical psychologist and I've got a few different jobs. Um, so my main clinical role is working in a young adult service in North Wales. And then I also get involved in small Wales projects. So one of those is writing self-help guides for people with diabetes. Um, and then I'm also doing a lot of COVID recovery work um, in diabetes at the moment and generally hanging around the internet and making a nuisance of myself with the rest of the 101 team. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all busy doing that. <laughs> So uh, we'll just have a little icebreaker while we're waiting for people to join the live Facebook feed. Um, so one of the questions that we thought we'd ask you first would be, what is your favourite uh, childhood story? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, I think if I had to choose one, probably the Moomin's books. Mm. Um, so, yeah, we read them loads as kids because my mum was born in Finland so there's a bit of a Finnish connection and um, so she had them when she was a kid and she always used to read them to us and so now I read them to my kids so that's that's really nice they've got gorgeous illustrations and they're the kind of um, like all the best children's books really they're the kind of thing that works on two levels so you've got like the story for kids but also there's deeper stuff going on that grown-ups can understand a bit more of so yeah, I love the idea of just hanging around in Finland in a load of lovely gardens and riding on clouds, I think is the best bit in one of the books. So yeah, the Moomins, I think, is here. And the Jolly Postman, that book rocks. Oh, yeah. All the pop-up things. Such a good book. <laughs> that's a good book, good memories. I like The Hungry Caterpillar. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Ooh, we yeah. got this amazing <laughs> pop-up version of the hungry caterpillar for my kids when um, they were tiny babies and the butterfly at the end like next level is very very cool Tamsin what's your favorite story um I'm probably an Enid Blight and kind of girl so I'm that age of the faraway tree and all of those sort of things so yeah I used to love all those like weird and wonderful and odd characters and yeah, and the Hungry Caterpillar, I love that one as well, that circle one. Yeah, we used to have the like the fairy like bits on the pages and all that sort of business. So yeah, those are mine. I've got a weird family connection with Enid Blyton. Um, so my great grandmother, who I never met, um, but she was a concert pianist and also called Enid, and she was best mates with Enid Blyton. And they wrote a book together called The Teacher's Treasury. Oh. which is full of really sort of cringy songs for teachers to play on the piano to children. <laughs> it's Welsh, wasn't she, Enid Blyton, I thought. I might yeah, just totally yeah. make that up. <laughs> I think you'll find everybody is Welsh if you look hard <laughs> enough. There's always some sort of Welsh connection. I think they even claim Bob Marley as being Welsh, so. Mm. Interesting. I think we might be having some technical difficulties with the Facebook feed. Uh, it doesn't appear to be live. <laughs> oh no! Ah. What do we do? No, it means I don't really want to ask you some of the questions in case it's not um, going out yet. Uh, How would we know if it's going out? Well, I've got the feed on, the on my um, phone and it's not. It's I not say I can't do it either. It says go to live video, but then... But that would just give you a live view of yourself. Yeah, <laughs> it did, yeah. want to do that. 
Mm. Maybe it's on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> or YouTube. Becky, or maybe it's going live somewhere random. What do you think? <laughs> like They're completely weird. We'll have to cut a little box out. on the top saying view stream on custom live streaming service or copy streaming link, but I don't want to do that in case I break anything. Yeah, because I've got a thing on mine that says live on custom live streaming service. Yeah, yeah. and under that it's got view stream and then, oh, well, that's gone now. Yeah. Oh, I think Becky switched it off. Cancel it and start again. That's the way. Turn it off and turn it on again. That's the way. There's a thing on Facebook saying we're having some technical difficulties. We'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Talking about children's books, did anyone who's of a similar age to me ever have the Violet Pickles books? No. Yeah. no. Oh. I used to like the Worst Witch. Oh yeah, yeah that was good. <laughs> Mildred, is it Mildred? Yeah. Yeah. Mildred Hubble. Yeah. Mildred Hubble. Yeah. Oh, they're great. They're really easy to read. I wasn't a good reader. <laughs> easy reads. I remember getting into the um, sort of like year five and six. Oh, when the book fair came to school, classic times. Um, <laughs> yeah. That had like the they had like the kids version of a file of facts. So I had the style of facts, the fun facts. They were really good. And then the, um, do you remember the Point Horror books? The R.L. Stein Point Horror. They were like yeah, horror books for children. One. Yeah, they were good. Hmm. Sorry, guys, I am trying to fix it for you. <laughs> Come on, Becky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to my, my page. Oh, we were streaming live on yours, Facebook, were we? No, we weren't, but I'm trying to reset it up now and it keeps going to my... Um, can we do it or not? Probably not. No, not, not unless we're in charge of the Zoom link. Is Becky still um, got admin rights to the... Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she sees all the crazy nutters we get apply. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope this isn't live. <laughs> to just like edit that bit out. <laughs> oh, it'll happen at some point. We'll work on our musical number for the end while we're waiting. Yeah, so we were going to ask you about your type type one books from that. <laughs> yeah, because we're getting. I think we'll have to start all over again, won't we? Because this has not gone anywhere, has it? And then when you put it on YouTube, just cut it, cut this bit until. <laughs> I feel like this is the best we bit. We're getting the best <laughs> content now. <laughs> This is the most interesting bit that everybody will be interested in. Oh my god, yeah. that is amazing. That we could just go I through jokingly all... said to my husband that we're you doing like brunch. a brunch thing, so you need to make me brunch. Right, look what <laughs> it turned up with. Oh, hang on. Oh, now I'm going to break my light. Oh, I've got wow. pizza, I've got olives, I've got breadsticks. It's amazing. Blimey. <laughs> Oh. Now I've broken my phone stand. There we go. the best prepared one we've had. That is. I, I, I got some pancakes once. <laughs> well, it is all a bit random. It's essentially an Italian lunch, and then there's just like one baby bell. It's all quite. No, live streaming. I think we're live. We're live. Yay! Yay! Oh, we fixed it. Woo. Well done, Becky. Yay, she did. So, so sorry about that, everybody. We were a little bit delayed. We've been chatting away, but no one could see us. Um, so we're going to have to start all over again. So admiring um, Rose's amazing brunch. We were. Rose has a wonderful okay. brunch uh, brought to her by uh, her lovely husband. Um, so we're all very jealous of the brunch. Uh, <laughs> the he husband. has to resist the temptation to start chowing down halfway through the course. Yeah, crunch, crunch, crunch. 
So um, we were going to ask you a few questions just as an icebreaker whilst we're waiting for people to join the live feed on um, on Facebook. Um, so uh, what is your favourite childhood story? Um, I think favourite childhood stories would probably be the Moomins books. Um, there's loads of them, there's about six. And it's, um, if you don't know the Moomins, they're about a family of trolls that live in Finland who just have this really idyllic life in the countryside and go on loads of fun adventures. Um, and yeah, so mum read them to us when we were little because mum was born in Finland, so there's a bit of a Finnish connection there um and yeah absolutely loved them and they're the, the kind of books that work on both a, a child and an adult um level so i've ended up reading them to my kids and sort of enjoying them all over again and i've got a bit of a thing when life is getting really stressful i go and read children's books so i quite often end up like in bed with the moomins or the winnie the pooh books um because yeah it just sort of feels like a bit of a safe place sometimes when the particularly times like this when the world is not feeling wonderful. I totally forgot that I've, I already introduced you once but we weren't live at the time so we should probably do that again. So we'll start with the team. My name is Amanda and I'm a diabetes specialist nurse working in Medway and Beth. Uh, I'm Beth, I'm a DSN down in Southampton. Tamsin. I'm Tamsin, I'm a diabetes specialist nurse at the Royal Stoke University Hospital. And Vicky. And I'm Vicky and I'm a community diabetes specialist nurse working for Liverpool Diabetes Partnership. And today we have with us our very special guest, the ultimate uh, doctor and psychologist, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ray Stewart. If she would like to give us a bit of a, a background of what you do, where you come from. <laughs> yeah, I'm Rose blind date. and <laughs> I'm Rose and I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, and I've got lots of jobs. Um, but my main clinical role is working in a young adult service up in North Wales um, but I also do a whole load of all Wales work so I've got a job writing guided self-help resources for people living with diabetes doing a lot of um, sort of leading the psychology thinking on Covid um, support and Covid recovery for all Wales at the moment and generally making a nuisance of myself on the internet with the rest of the 101 team. Brilliant. Um, so we were talking about childhood stories and there was a there was a reason behind that because um, a little birdie tells us, well that's not a birdie, it's more like a big hairy elephant type mammoth type thing, <laughs> that, that there might be a surprise coming to NHS England. Uh, sometime. To NHS England, yes, finally. Um, so these are, this is about the talking type one books that I write for NHS Wales. Um, so we've got four of them at the moment. So I've got some here to show you. Um, so these are this one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this one is diabetes, distress, and burnout for parents and carers. So we've got three that look like this. This one's for parents, obviously. Um, and we've got a book called Diabetes Burnout and a book called Not Okay with Needles. And the idea with these books is that it's sort of spreading the psychology love out as far as we possibly can because we know that um, getting a psychologist into a service is really tricky for a lot of trusts and then even when you do have a psychologist in the service that quite often um, there isn't enough psychology time to see everybody or for whatever reason people might not want to see a psychologist but quite often the team are pretty aware that there's issues going on behind the scenes so the idea with these books is that it's offering people the ability to do some psychology work without maybe having to go and do formal therapy sessions with a psychologist. And it's picking off some of those um, sort of more straightforward problems that a psychologist would see. So I work with diabetes burnout day in, day out, and the same with needle phobia. So the idea with the books is that somebody who might not be a psychologist, so DSNs, for example, perfectly placed to do this work, could give somebody one of these books and then give them a bit of support around using the book. And it means that you have basically a mini psychology intervention within your service. So I kind of see it a bit like 
carbs and cows, but for diabetes psychology. So it's not going to solve all the really complicated problems, but it's really helpful for teams to be able to support people. So we've got the three books that are aimed more at grown ups, and then we have a children's book as well, which is this one. This is How to Manage a Mammoth. Love so this mama. is a kid's storybook and it's been properly illustrated by um, this guy called Rich Dwyer who is the most amazing illustrator. He does illustrations like this. So that's a diabetes team there. This is a oh. mammoth trying to fit into a car. So it's really, really cute. And the idea with mammoths, oh my goodness. Yes, got a fancy coffee as well. Oh, <laughs> well today. We're all very so, jealous now. Yeah, I know. So the idea with the mammoth book is um, that it's a proper storybook that kids enjoy listening to. And um, I know they enjoy it because I've tested it repeatedly on my poor children. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the idea because so many... Um, of the children's resources for diabetes, uh, all about sort of instructions or saying, this is how you'll feel, um, or about one person's particular experience. And the idea with the Mammoth book is that it's a storybook about a little boy called Jake and his mum, and they live with Mel the Diabetes Mammoth. And most of the time, Mel is just sort of there in the background, you find. But then sometimes when Jake's diabetes is being a problem, so he's having lots of highs or he's had a big hypo while he's playing football, something like that, that he starts to grow. So he's this magic mammoth. And um, when Jake's diabetes is a problem, Mel gets bigger and bigger. And Jake goes through a period where his diabetes is being a big problem. It's making him feel sad. It's making him have lots of arguments with his mum. And so Mel gets absolutely huge and he's right in the way. And so they've got to work out how to make a mammoth shrinking plan. And Jake and his mum sort of go and see the diabetes team. They go and see their friends. Um, they go and see another little girl who has diabetes, Anisha, who lives with Sid, the diabetes hedgehog. Um, and they sort of make this shrinking plan. And they manage to shrink down Mel. So he's like a little pocket size, like a teddy. And he doesn't go away because we don't ever want diabetes go away but it's getting kids to actually sometimes it can feel like a really big problem but there's stuff that we can do to shrink it and there's this big activity section at the end of the book where kids draw their own diabetes creatures and can get really creative and sort of write their own stories about their diabetes creature um, and that's been really cool actually because we've had this out in Wales for um, goodness me a year that, that year went quickly um, and yeah we've got um, like we've got consultants in South Wales who've said things like my my wall is now covered with kids diabetes creatures and then we had one group where over Christmas they set a project for their diabetes support group where the kids all drew pictures of their diabetes creatures and then they had it made into a tea towel a bit like the self-portraits that they do at primary school um but yeah the sort of the magic with the book is that it's a story book but it's actually a secret acceptance and commitment therapy based intervention um but kids don't know it's like ninja therapy um but yeah the really exciting news with with that entire range um because we've had them out in wales for a while um is that we are so close to sorting out a, finally a publishing deal and i've been working with Partha car and nhs england to secure a big load of funding, which means that copies of these books will be available for free in all units in NHS England. So both the paediatric and the adult units, there will be stocks of books for everybody. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so that was one of the questions on um, Facebook actually is when they'll be available. So I think that, that one's been answered. There's a couple more questions, Very one from Chantelle. She's asking, um, What's your perspective of a role of a diabetes psychology and community focusing on type two diabetes? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think you could have a few different roles within that. It would depend on sort of how much time you've got in the role. Um, but for people with type two diabetes, I think it's, I often sort of hear this argument that there's no point in doing anything for people with type 2 because there's far too many people you'd never sort of meet the level of need 
actually I think there's a lot that psychologists could do um so I think for example groups of people with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes there is a lot that you could do to get in there to boost motivation um to sort of help people stop spiraling because a lot of people feel really anxious on diagnosis and it becomes a bit overwhelming so Mm. I think you could definitely input there needle phobia is a massive issue I've met people um with type 2 of one woman I met who needed to be on injectable therapies but delayed that for 10 years because she was so scared of needles so there's a really significant level of need there. And of course, a lot of people with type 2 end up with the same complications as people with type 1 diabetes. So support around living with complications and all of the psychological impact that that can have is, yeah, absolutely huge. Yeah, I think um, Beth's got another question. Yeah, so probably the biggest question, which probably most of the people have tuned in to ask is how do we get a rose in our service and do you have a case to share um (laughs) i know you get i do actually a lot (laughs) Mm. i do i do have a business case that i'm allowed to share because it's recently been approved it's so exciting um so the big tips um and lots of ways that you can do it. But if you are coming from a diabetes side, the first thing that you absolutely need to do is to link in with your local health psychology department. I cannot stress that enough um, because you need to work together to formulate this business case. We've um, quite often seen um, where it goes wrong is people coming at it just from one side, either the psychology side or the, um, the diabetes side. So working together is absolutely key. I think in terms of our business case, the things that worked for us is that our business case is for adult diabetes psychology. And we have um, within it said that the posts need to be sort of half of the time needs to be protected for young adults. It's quite easy to make the case for young adults. Um, Things like the GERFT report that came out a couple of months ago has the recommendation that all adult services should have integrated psychology. So use that. There's a beautiful graph that shows the DKA rates for young adults, which is absolutely key. And um, there's evidence from our service on the QIC awards site about the impact that we had on DKA rates. So when we integrated psychology into our service, our DKA rate went down by 40%. And I'm not saying all of that is psychology, um, but we make in evidence and things like the Diabetes UK and missing reports is really key. Um, I think what once you've actually written the business case itself, um, because I know I was in this position, I very naively thought if we wrote a nice business case, people would fall over themselves to give us the funding. <laughs> and in the real world, it doesn't really work like that. Um, so once you've got this case done, it's really important to have a network of people that support that base. So things like your uh, patient reference, they were absolutely key because it worked well. And they were really good, just constantly hammering home that we need this. And they were often able to access things like ministers that I'm interested in. And our local Diabetes UK group as well were really interested in the profile of an area of need. Realize, yeah, it's the, the getting the basic cross and uh, what I'll do because things saying I might be breaking up so free if my signal's being rubbish um so yeah if um if the basics of the business case are done it's all about sort of getting the the network around it and getting pressure from all areas um people might be aware in NHS England there is transformation money Um, from the transformation fund coming in the spring so it's a really good time at the moment to try and get business cases together yeah somebody said about um they've got issues with 
linking up with health psychology departments as maybe they're different organisations and therefore there's a question on supervision for those people? Yeah, it can be tr tricky. Often um, health psychology departments become the mental health experts. It's a lot simpler in Wales, um, but yeah, I'm finding talking to colleagues in England, quite often the mental health side of things are under a completely trust to the physical health side of things. Mm. Um, unfortunately, I, I don't know sort of specific guidance, but that would be something where it's getting people around the table and working out um, sort of what can be done. I know certainly in terms of my service, um, in terms of sort of organisational stuff, we're funded by diabetes, but in terms of line management and supervision, we are through clinical psychology, but we are one trust, so that's a bit simpler. Um, but yeah, that kind of situation, it's, it's getting people around the table and recognising that this is a priority for everybody. There will be a way around it, but yeah, it's really tricky. It's a bit more wiggling around needed. Um, so, mm, mm. Rose, you mentioned that you were able to share the business case. How how could people access that? Um, I think the easiest thing to do, um, so I've got a website that I put things onto sometimes and I will try and um, get the business case page sorted this weekend. Um, so the website is diabetespsychologymatters.com um, and we're using that as a bit of a hosting place for the Diabetes Psychology Network. So we've got lots of infographics, lots of information about diabetes psychology. There's information about the books on there. Um, but I'll add in a section about business cases um, and I'll try and get this map sorted. We're trying to do a map of the UK of where all the diabetes psychologists are so you can find your local psychologist and pester them. <laughs> so I'll try and get that sorted this weekend. Once you've got the link, we can also link it on the DSN forum website and the 101 mm. website will we'll put like yeah. adverts to, to your to your page on those two websites as well, I think. So everybody knows where to get it. Tamsin, did you see any other questions on Facebook? Um, yeah, I mean, just going back, I, I mean, I know we talked about the transformation funds on previous brunches. Um, and I still think, I don't think we've ever got a very clear answer as to how people access those transformation funds. We keep asking, but they never really say how they do it. Do you know, Rose, how they, they get access to those transformation funds? Ask Partha. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I think it's local, isn't it? I think yeah. you're your local STP gets the um, the money and they decide what, where it's spent. So you've got to convince them that this is worth spending money on because they only get a finite pot and they have to decide between different things. And um, yeah, so we know in our area as well, we had to kind of come up with a plan together. So it covers multiple trusts and areas. It's not just about what our trust wanted. So we all had to get together and come up with what we wanted to kind of maybe get with the money. So maybe a rose, but we had to share her amongst all of the services or whatever. Sure. Somebody gets an arm, somebody gets a leg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> rose, is there an agreement with um, NHS Scotland yet for your books? Uh, no, I have contacted them to let them know that they are available. Um, but I've not heard anything back yet. So if anybody up there is NHS Scotland, now is the time to pressure your sort of national diabetes group. Um, I think particularly initially with the books, what I would really recommend to people in the sort of home nations is rather than sort of buying a few copies for one hospital, I would really encourage people to sort of go to your national level and think about doing a bigger national purchase because a you get a massive discount on the book so they go down from something like 299 to 38p um so it's a better use of nhs budgets but also it's about things like postcode lotteries um because we want everybody to be able to access um the books as far as we possibly can um so yeah i'd really encourage if you're in nhs scotland sort of feed it up to your your national planning groups and 
see if we can get access that way. So it's mainly that they're going to be accessed through the hospitals. So is there any access in primary care? There's a question there from Amber. So in GP surgeries, I think. Yeah, that's well, the I. Yes, but in Wales, that's something that we've been really working on. We've organised a reprint of diabetes burnout, and that's going to be particularly going out to um, primary care. So the NHS England um, um, distribution plan at the moment is that it will be locally organised. So the publishers have like a big boat that comes full of books and then it's up to the local teams to work out how they should be distributed. So the plan will probably be that most of these books end up in the specialist diabetes centres and specialist um, in secondary care. But if you are primary care in that area, I'd really encourage you to contact your local secondary care service and say, we want some of these books as well. Um, because I think the worst case scenario for me is that these books end up in a cupboard somewhere and they don't get used. Yeah, so <laughs> we want them out sort of as far as we can so that, yeah, people can access them. They will also um, at some point be available for purchase. So if there are people that want um, copies just for themselves and they either don't feel comfortable raising that with their team or they for whatever reason have struggled to get them through their team they will be um, available we think through the JDRF website. Brilliant. Um, I think there was one question there about supervision. Um, what kind of supervision do you have just along the lines of supporting others mental health and having support with that? From Sam. So <laughs> As a clinical psychologist, I have to have clinical supervision um, or I am working way away from guidelines. Um, so I have uh, supervision with a colleague who works in a different service. So it's not particularly about diabetes. It's more about the psychology side of things. Uh, that's pretty common um, in health psychology. We all sort of supervise across different physical health areas. Um, and then in terms of supervising other people, um, so at the moment I supervise a few people in different services and then when we have trainees in the service I supervise them. I know colleagues who work in other diabetes psychology services offer um, sort of staff supervision. So that kind of thing might involve running supervision groups where people are discussing complex or difficult cases. Sometimes it's specific pieces of training work. So, um, for example, well, I've got um, dietitians in our service where we've done sort of particular sessions on boosting motivational interviewing skills, that kind of thing. Um, and lots of services at the moment um, are offering things like staff wellbeing support, because obviously it's a very, very stressful time for lots of people. So for some psychologists, that's meant that they've been redeployed into staff support services. But for other services like um, mine, so I'm still in the diabetes service, but I've sort of put it out to all the diabetes staff that if you need to talk, if things are difficult, come and find me. So there's lots of different ways we can go about it. So Rose, how, do you, how does somebody get into psychology if this is an interest for them? How do they progress? Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay, so to become a clinical psychologist, most jobs in the NHS are either clinical or counselling psychologists. Um, so to become a clinical psychologist, you need to do an undergraduate psychology degree. Um, and you need to make sure that that undergrad course has something called GBR, which is Graduate Basis for Registration. And that means it's recognised by the British Psychological Society as a good undergrad course. Um, so you do your undergrad. And then generally people need two to three years worth of work experience. So that might be as an assistant psychologist, it might be as um, a therapist. So I worked in an IAP service as a psychological wellbeing practitioner for two years. Um, some people do master's courses, some people do PhDs and they come into psychology more from a, a research end. Um, so once you've got those sort of two to three years of work experience, then you can apply for the Doctorate of Clinical Psychology. 
and those are there's different courses all over the UK but they're difficult to get into sort of notoriously difficult so obviously the more work experience the more research experience you've got the more chance you've got of getting in um and then the DQIN course is about three years and that's a mixture of um, doing research work and clinical placements within the NHS and then you are a clinical psychologist um, and then so ah. once you're qualified you can sort of choose what area you want to work in and so I chose physical health and I ended up in diabetes. Mm. Thank you. Oh, that's not a short route, is it? <laughs> um, so one question, which probably, again, is quite a popular one, is what are maybe the top three psychological issues that you would see in people with diabetes that maybe a DSN can help with, or maybe some tips on how we can recognise those or some assessments we can use in our care to help the person without maybe if we don't have a, a rose in our service? Um, so I think... The most important skill that you have as a DSN is sort of knowing the people that you work with and having those relationships with people. That's absolutely key. And in diabetes and particularly uh, type one, we've got these really long term relationships between people with diabetes and the teams that support them. And quite often, like PEDS, for example, we've got people who get diagnosed at the age age of two and they're working with the same dude until they're 17 so you've known this child their entire life so I think there's quite often this feeling that I need to do like screening measures I need to do checklists I need an official score that tells me that someone's upset but actually you know this person you know when something's not right so I think really big thing is sort of trusting that relationship and trusting your own skills as a human being that cares about this person that actually you can do a huge amount of work I think there's quite often a fear with some people that talking about issues like distress or um, even suicidal thoughts that kind of thing there's a fear that you're going to make it worse and that is hardly ever, ever the case. That actually being able to talk with somebody about the struggles, being able to really, really listen and just to be there and being able to say sometimes, yeah, it is crap. Understand that you feel it's crap and being able to sort of share that feeling is really, really important because I think so often where diabetes teams might go wrong is that we feel like we've got to jump in with answers, that you've got to give somebody solutions to this issue. Um, and that's not always what's needed. Sometimes the most important thing is just to be there and to really, really listen and to help that person feel supported. Because quite often they already know what they need to do. They already know what the answers are, but they just feel lost and alone with the entire situation. So... I think being able to really listen, really empathise is always number one and it's 90% of the work that a psychologist does is listening and empathy and you guys can definitely do that. Um, and then I think quite often um, a theme that I see over and over again in people with diabetes is feeling overwhelmed, that it feels like it's too much. And that's the big thing that comes with people when they get into diabetes burnout. Um, and so it's really helpful then to just sort of work with a person to take the pressure off. So saying, okay, obviously things are not in a great place at the moment, but what is one step that we can take? What is step one on this journey to getting you back to where you want to be? And being able to really recognize that um, for so many people, they get lost in this place where they think that actually HbA1c or time and range is the most important thing in the world. And if I'm not getting the HbA1c or the time and range that I want, I'm failing. And being able to help people recognize that actually diabetes control isn't the goal of your life. It is not the most important thing there that actually your life is a bigger thing. It's about, I don't know, being a great parent, having a relationship, seeing the world, whatever it is that's important to you. But diabetes management is the thing that will help you to do all of that stuff. 
So I think as DSNs, it's really helpful to be able to sort of reframe that sometimes. So helping people recognize why diabetes management is important. So it's not about avoiding complications. It's about going off and having a fabulous life. And that helps people feel way more positive. And then being able to work with that person on a step-by-step plan. So not just really pushing that you must be this level or whatever else, but working out what is step number one, because that takes so much pressure off people and helps them to recognize that actually can vary what you're doing. Um, And another thing that's often quite helpful is um, something I call dynamic goal setting. So if somebody's working on improving their diabetes management, I'll often get them to set two versions of their goals. So they will have good day goals. So when I'm feeling good, when I'm feeling like I can do this, when I'm feeling in control, this is what I'm going to aim for. And then bad day goals. So when I am feeling tired, when I'm stressed, when I can't cope, I'm going to aim for this plan. And the message with that is that we can vary the pressure that we put on ourselves, but diabetes never stops. So you can take the pressure off, but you don't ever stop. Because so often now it's because they put a huge amount of pressure on themselves and then they can't do it anymore. And so it just goes, stops completely. So it's about trying to find a gray areas between that sort of all or nothing management for a lot of people. Mm. And DSNs can definitely do that. That's a really good tip, actually. I will take that. (laughs) I think that leads on to Alison's question. So she's written... (laughs) Now we're doing far more telephone and virtual consultations, often when we've not met the person. What advice do you have for first approaches or introducing yourself, especially when you're dealing with someone who's just been told they have diabetes or their diabetes is poorly controlled? Is that the word we're allowed to say? Managed, poorly managed? Not, we're yeah. not allowed to say that. Well, that's <laughs> not poorly. I don't know. I've lost with management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, the management is not optimal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is tricky. We're, we're trying to build this relationship with a person when all of our normal relationship building tools aren't there. Um, I think, yeah, I think drawing on my experience from trying to engage young adults that really do not want to be engaged, um, the biggest thing, and it might not always work with your diaries because I know how much pressure you are under to sort of fit 30 calls or however many into a day. Um, but to have space within the consultation, particularly at the beginning, to talk about stuff that's not diabetes. So find out more about this person's world. So who are the people that are important to you? Um, what do you want to do in your life? Like if the pandemic wasn't on, where would you like to be? That kind of thing. So a classic sort of icebreakers almost. But just to get a bit of a sense of this person as a person and not just a person whose pancreas is misbehaving um, is really important. And it starts to build that relationship. And then what I would then do is make sure that you write that information down. So if somebody's told you that, I don't know, I'm here with my dog, next time you ring them, how's the dog doing? So it's almost sort of building in that relationship, that friendship aspect of things. It's not easy at the moment. It's really not. But I think it's it's about sort of trying to build that human connection. And sometimes that means getting more about the person about their life, but it might also mean if you're comfortable sharing a little bit of your life so they don't need to know your life story but just sort of saying things like oh yeah my cat might come into the zoom call that kind of thing that makes you human to them as well and so it starts to build that connection that way so yeah boost the humanity is the big thing I'm, I'm very good at that turning up the draggle that I've just left the school run and my hair's like this <laughs> it's all part of your therapeutic plan Beth. Yeah, definitely yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, all it's, it's organized <laughs> very skilled <laughs> just changing the subject slightly rose um so you're part of the diabetes uk clinical champion program aren't you um can you tell us a little bit mm-hmm. about what work you've done as part of that and how people might 
um, apply to be a clinical champion? Yeah. Oh God, the clinical champions program has been amazing. Um, so yeah, I ended up applying twice. The first time they refused me and they wooed for day. <laughs> they refused, they refused um, me. <laughs> Oh, Amanda. I know. I haven't, I haven't been brave enough um, to apply again. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, like the next year when I applied and I looked back on the previous application, I thought, yeah, I wouldn't have accepted me either. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it is worth reapplying. It definitely is. Um, so the Clinical Champions Programme, you have to apply with a project in mind. Um, and so I had a project that was, because obviously I've got two jobs, so it's a sort of project about both jobs. The, the overarching thing was about sort of growing diabetes psychology, growing the profile of it, so getting it out to the masses. Um, and then I had more specific goals for my clinical service about getting young people involved in um, sort of designing the service and really getting their voices inbuilt into the service um and then yeah so you have your scary interview you get onto the clinical champions course and then you get transported in normal times to the wonderful place that is ashridge which is this amazing fancy house um with the most beautiful staircase that was the inspiration for the magic staircase in harry potter you know the one in hogwarts that moves around um, it's a really incredible place, actually. And so you're with this big group of other people from across the UK, champions from a whole range of backgrounds. Um, and it's a sort of very intense um, leadership training type stuff. And you start to recognise quite quickly that the programme isn't about your particular project. It's about you that you are the project um, which can be a bit scary at the beginning but actually it's really really good um, and so I think I found from my experience on the program um, that it's been a lot of what I've learned has been about sort of managing my own imposter syndrome stuff so I used to really second guess myself and sort of really feel nervous about approaching people with ideas and um yeah, would really sort of not feel like I deserve to be sort of talking to people about stuff. But being on the programme has really helped and it's made me a lot braver. I like talking to you guys. Um, and it's plugging you into a network as well, which is really, really important because suddenly you're part of the, the DUK network. So you're in a network with the other champions. But also, as DUK gets stuff coming in that's related to psychology or your particular area, they'll then start coming to you and saying, what do you think about this? Or would you like to get involved in this project? So it sort of really helped that way. And then within my own trust, because when you get onto the programme, DUK do like this massive media offensive and they um, like write letters to all of the top people in your trust saying, you've got a champion in your team. Like you really need to talk to this person. This person's amazing. They know so much about diabetes. And suddenly like I got invited to a meeting with the chief exec who like had literally, I'd never even been in the same room as this person before. Um, so it gives you a lot of legitimacy within your own trust as well. And suddenly your trust takes you seriously. And so that then opens lots of doors um, for your projects and really sort of allows you to be able to say, no, I will be attending this meeting because I am the local clinical champion. And you can sort of use that as armour, I found. So, yes, I do have an opinion on this as the clinical champion, um, which has been really, really helpful, actually. So for our trust. Um, it was huge because yeah suddenly like we had lots of press and things like that and our trust had to say yes we're proud of this diabetes psychologist and oh yeah there's a business case isn't there so I think actually the champions program was quite instrumental in getting the business case through. Fabulous. 
great so and the yeah. food is amazing <laughs> <laughs> that's that a lot from people so much oh my god i didn't believe it when people kept saying that i didn't believe it but really really it's so good Mm. Um, I don't think we've got many more questions. I think there's just one from, uh, oh, is that from you, Beth? <laughs> well, I was just going to say, are there any, um, obviously we've got your website, um, are there any other resources or apps mm -hmm. that you would recommend that we can signpost uh, people we help or work with to um, in the absence of Yeah, there's, there's a load of really good apps out there because I think in diabetes service, there's a lot of normal mental health stuff that comes through the door that might not necessarily mm. um, need a sort of referral off to mental health services, for example. Um, so yeah, just thinking about um, recent clinics we've had, we've had sort of people who can't sleep, that kind of thing, and sort of people just managing the stress of the pandemic. Um, so I would definitely recommend the NHS Apps Library because there's a whole load of apps on there and they've all been checked through um, by the NHS experts. So you know they're going to be decent. Um, so one that I keep recommending at the moment is the Sleepio app um, because that's all linked into NHS research. And they did a recent RCT on it and they found that actually people got better results using the Sleepio app than they did sleep like it's amazing it's really good um things like the headspace app the calm app useful so there's a lot out there but go to the nhs because it's all been um, done um i think in terms of our own well-being as well because it's yeah slightly stressful at the moment if anyone hasn't noticed <laughs> yeah. um so the people.nhs.uk website is really really good um i'm hoping that most people have got access to staff support services in their own trust but i recognize that it's not there for, um, for everyone or it's at a time you can't access or if you've been on the phone all day the last thing you want to do is ring a helpline um mm -hmm. so yeah the people.nhs.uk website is really really good there's loads of stuff there's um links to all of the apps and lots of them have got um free access for nhs staff at the moment so go and see what you can get for free um there's things the like app library yeah so nhs app library for stuff for patients mm -hmm. and then stuff for you it's people.nhs.uk Cool. I've put it in the chat so that people can get the links. So. Bad. Yeah, because, um, yeah, there's all sorts on there for staff support. There is um, a helpline, there's apps, there's sort of virtual common rooms they were doing where you can just sort of go and be with other people. Mm. Loads of sort of videos on support, loads of resources on there. So definitely worth checking that out. Even if you're not feeling particularly stressed, it can be really useful just to know what's there. Um, in terms of supporting colleagues or maybe if you're a manager people that report to you it's really worth checking it out and seeing what's there right I think we've got one last question it's getting getting on now in nearly an hour it's gone fast isn't it um so from Sarah she's asking any top tips for teenagers with anxiety and diabetes okay so <laughs> <laughs> I, I should be listening to this one I think I love it. my son is uh, just about to turn into a teenager next month and uh, he's, he's definitely got um, anxiety about getting his pump out in, in public he doesn't like mm. to, to bolus at school because he doesn't want people to see it and yeah yeah it's really tricky it's a difficult time um, I think for teenagers, um, and obviously at the moment in the pandemic, they're just having an absolute nightmare. It is a really crap time at the moment. It's actually a lot better because he's here and I can help. <laughs> and there's no forgetting then because he's not at school. So he's actually this is true, home. yeah. <laughs> Apart from um, there's no exercise, so. Yeah, not so good. All the not so good. Are on. <laughs> um, but I think. The big thing for teenagers is to try and remember what motivates them. And the biggest thing that motivates teenagers is friends. So um, 
there's if you look at teenagers brains and brain scanners like being around their mates has a magic impact on sort of MRI scans so what you'll find with teenagers brains is that they really get motivated by social stuff so peer pressure impressing their mates all the rest of it they are very very reward centric um so anything that's rewarding anything that causes a dopamine rush for you and me as boring grown-ups our brains sort of light up a little bit for a teenager they get massive rushes which is why like i don't know falling in love with the most terrible terrible man as a teenager feels wonderful um <laughs> because yeah your brain does all of this cool stuff that we just don't get as adults it's sad um, and they're also much less responsive to risk. So they don't care about the consequences of their actions. And it's literally hardwired into their neurobiology. So it's sort of thinking about that brain and what we can use with that brain. So if we're trying to motivate people, it's about using rewards rather than punishments. And then if you are trying to reduce anxiety, one of the biggest things that you can do is social support, uh, which I completely get is really, really difficult at the moment with the pandemic. But in normal times, what I would be saying is drag them along to something like the, the DK Weekenders or the JDRF Discovery Days. They need to meet other people, other people with diabetes because they are so motivated by peers and feeling normal. So if you can get them into a group of other people with diabetes where they feel normal, they can then transfer that stuff out into the wider world. Um, I think it's really important as well, thinking about sort of parents and the anxieties that a degree of going off the rails is so, so normal and sometimes it is a case of, okay, we've just got to let them fall a little bit and then we can come back to it because it gets very, very difficult at the best of times, um, even in a kid without diabetes to parent them through the teenage years. Um, but yeah, so often the teenage rebellion gets acted out through a young person's diabetes. So I think as difficult as it feels sometimes sometimes you do have to back off and let them discover this stuff for themselves and quite often using the diabetes team if you can to um, have some of the fights on your behalf so you don't feel like you're just constantly arguing with the young person is useful if you've got a youth worker in your service they are amazing and they can sort of come in as the good guy who's not the diabetes team, not the parent, but also is able to be responsible. And um, all the youth workers I know are really cool. We're trainers. And yeah, they are, care And stuff like that. <laughs> I know. Trains. Like, I think ours are called Diego or something, which is like... Oh, wow. That's so cool. And I'll be asking you for the business case now for the <laughs> youth workers. <laughs> um, but yeah, youth workers are amazing and so often um in the the sort of peed service that feeds into ours youth workers have been instrumental where everybody else has been able to engage them because you can in normal times um laugh and take for a coffee or meet someone at the mm. skate park and be really cool whereas we're like come to my therapy room <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so I think being able to take the pressure off and I think one of the big things in engaging teenagers as well is if you say we have to sit down and talk about this problem it switches them off and it puts them under pressure so do something else with them and youth workers are great at this so like I don't know like go bowling or something and then just happen to throw diabetes into the conversation and that way the young person feels under much less pressure you don't get the barriers up so yeah don't make it into a big thing so have these little conversations when you're both doing something else and you're both feeling quite good rather than trying to have a big sit down chat about the whole situation 
Right, I think that's probably um, the end of our session today, but it's been absolutely amazing uh, to have you here, Rose. Thank you so much for giving up your Saturday morning. Yeah. Um, we'll let you go and eat your breadsticks. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'm you really excited listen. about it. <laughs> get your baby bell eaten. <laughs> and if, if there's any um, anything bell. else you want to ask Rose, just put your comments in the um, Facebook live and we'll um, we'll ask her because we've got WhatsApps <laughs> uh, groups and uh, yeah. we can always answer the questions <laughs> later if, if, if people are watching this later. Um, but I think that's a goodbye from us.